Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you uh, for taking the time out of your busy lives again to join us for another Saints Talk, uh, short presentations by leading members of our academic community on subjects that we hope are of general interest. My name is David Williams. I look after the uh, supporter and alumni relationship with St Andrews, and I'm delighted to welcome you this evening and to introduce you to Dr Geoffrey Muir. Dr. Mira is the founding director of the Centre for Art and Politics and a research fellow at the St Andrews Hander Centre for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence. Violence, excuse me. He received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and his research is in the interaction between and intersection of sociology, politics, and psychoanalysis where he explores the performances of collective identity through acts of violence and works of imagination. Dr. Miro will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes and then he will take questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can do so through the team's taskbar. Uh, please don't put your full name as for data protection reasons. Uh, we try not to publish them unless they're especially interesting. Uh, we will aim to in, uh, finish about 6 p.m. And now over to Dr. Muro. Thank you. Oh, thank you, David. And um, it's really my pleasure. Thank you all for, for joining me this evening. And um, I would like to give just a kind of brief talk to discuss the connections between art and politics, but also perhaps surprisingly, the connections between art and violence. Um, often these things don't appear to necessarily go together. And yet, if we think about the ways that these works of imagination can inspire us, they can act as um, acts of resistance, that they can become ways that the established order is communicated to, to people, that um, this becomes a very, very important way of understanding how it can motivate people both to do good things, but also perhaps to do um, acts of destruction. So I'd like to begin just by saying, uh, back in, in um, the 1970s, uh, or sorry, in the, in the late 1960s, um, Barnett Newman painted this painting called Who's Afraid of Blue, Ye uh, Red, Yellow, and Blue? And it's a very, very large painting. Um, you can see what he calls two zips. There's a zip of blue there on the far left and a zip of yellow on the very, very far right. And Newman was drawn to this mode of abstract um, expressionist painting, like so many of his contemporaries, asking how can we do narrative figurative painting after the Holocaust? How can we depict the human form after so much destruction? And he saw his art then as a way of communicating aesthetics, as communicating a vision, but also communicating, right, feeling. And in fact, this painting, and here you can see it to scale, it's a very large painting. It actually engendered a great deal of um, emotion and a great deal of feeling. When the Stedeldijk Museum in Amsterdam acquired the painting in 1969, it almost immediately, the museum received numerous letters from people saying they were quite disturbed by the painting, that these two zips, as, as Newman called them, the blue and the yellow, they seemed to glow, they seemed to move. And many people described feeling upset, actually feeling disturbed by the painting. Moreover, Newman painted this red in the center with such depth. He painted coat after coat, layer after layer of red. Many art historians said you could fall into this red. And for some people, the idea of falling into the painting itself was quite disturbing. One woman said she wrote to the museum to say that it made her physically sick to look at this painting. Surely this is the reaction that many painters, many artists, would like. If they like a reaction to a painting, surely he got one. Then in 1986, Gerard Jean van Bladeren walked into the museum and said that red, yellow, and blue number three was a cultural provocation that called for a reaction and that he was the man to provide that reaction. And this was his reaction. He walked up to the painting, he pulled out an X-Acto knife, and he slashed the painting 47 different times, making the painting almost irreparable. He did, quote, what he thought that others would have liked 
to have done. And in fact, after his act, he dropped the razor blade on the ground, uh, on the floor of the gallery. He sat on the bench and he looked back at his vision, very, very contemplative about what he had done to the painting. He received five months in prison for this attack. And in 1997, he actually returned to the Sedlodyke to finish the job, um, but he couldn't find the painting. And there was another Newman painting, this painting called Cathedral, and uh, Von Bladeren slashed this painting as well. And you can see the slash perhaps on the very, very far right. Cathedral has just this one intentional white stripe. And if you can look on the very far right, right, Cathedral has this other slash in it. The painting moved him so much that he wanted to create violence. Now, perhaps we just think of this as iconoclasm, but there's a long tradition of paintings really moving people. We can think of this great painting by Picasso, Guernica, which he painted in 1937 after the Nazi um, Condor Legion bombed the Basque capital, Guernica, in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. This painting filled with emotion, right, was also attacked where uh, a, a, a young man, Tony Safarazzi, in 1974, walked up to the painting and painted on it in red, kill all lives. The idea that even a Picasso right, might be the subject of such iconoclasm, I think begs a lot of questions. And perhaps it's not just that these are questions of personal idiosyncrasy, but rather we can think of these things as being connected to much larger politics. This is a photograph of the Bamiyan Gautama Buddha in Afghanistan. It was built in the sixth century and there are actually two Buddhas side by side. And perhaps some of them you may know, or perhaps some of you, you may know uh, this Buddha because the Taliban destroyed it in 2001. One of the reasons why the Taliban destroyed this was not so much that they had an issue with Buddhism, although the type of Islam that many within the Afghan Taliban practice is so austere that they would see this as problematic. But the Taliban had been in power basically since 1992 and hadn't fought to destroy the Buddha until 2001. And the reason why they did was because they decided that the West was too interested in it, that it was a way of actually lashing out to the West itself. And so here we might think of other ways that we can think of iconoclasm. This is a photograph from uh, Mosul from 2014. After ISIL had taken control of Northern Iraq, ISIL fighters went in to the Mosul Museum and destroyed these beautiful ancient pieces of Assyrian art. And here we see an ISIS fighter uh, with a hacksaw carving off the face of this uh, Assyrian griffin. Unless we think that that kind of violence is actually associated with Islam or that other part of the world, we should remember here in St. Andrews that the cathedral itself was ransacked in 1559 by a mob who was incited by John Knox to tear down that iconography of Catholicism that was inside of the cathedral. And then, of course, later the cathedral now, of course, is missing because Protestants took the stones of the cathedral to build their own churches all around St. Andrews. So we see these motivations, these ideas of artwork as somehow being connected either to people in the way that the Taliban thought that the Buddhas were connected to the West, or the ways that the paintings themselves are engendering reactions for all the people who were troubled by who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue in the Sedlodaj. But we might also think about how politics is not the, the struggle for power, so often uh, we think of politics, but rather the French uh, social philosopher, social theorist, Jean Franciere stated that rather politics is, or art is political, and the politics of art are all about configurations of space, right? That politics is about framing a sphere of experience about framing objects and deciding systems of authorized subjects who then are legitimized to make that frame. In this sense, we can think of politics right, as organizing the configuration of space that places objects within it. And as such, politics then is about denying what objects might be in that same space. For the Taliban, those Buddhas were objects that were tolerable to a point and then suddenly became intolerable. 
And their politics suggested right, that the reconfiguration of their political space meant that those had to be erased. So we can think in that sense a politics is about apportioning space and time, about determining the visible and the invisible, and in a way about determining speech and noise. And perhaps along with noise, thinking about how politics is also about silence. Who speaks, where they speak, how they speak, for whom do they speak, and who is denied right, access to speaking. That, for Ranciere, that's the definition of politics. And so if we think about the, this ability to introduce subjects and objects, to make visible that which had not been visible before, to make heard those who had not been heard before, as Ranciere put it, right, to make heard as speakers those that were previously perceived as noisy animals. And we can think of the history of colonial politics, whereby certain colonial subjects were not allowed to speak. And how does our idea of history or politics or power change when those who had not been allowed to speak are allowed to speak. And here we can think of speaking as not just then right, the acts of speech, but also we can think of them as the reverse, right, to make the invisible or the silence to deny, but we can also then think of these as acts of erasure, right, in as much as they may be acts of promotion. And so in this sense, we can think of art as being political because it has the ability to alter space-time. It has the ability to alter space-time because it allows us to think about where things belong and when they belong. And when we think about framing an audience, where are we supposed to see this? And if we see it somewhere where perhaps we don't expect to see it, then we can suddenly see the interactions between the material world, the symbolic world, between language and space. And we can think about which entity is authorized to speak for whom. So we can think of performances of identity as modes of social capital. That is, that we can think of economic capital as, as one way of having status. We can think of social capital as another way of having sta status that is being able to perform in a social manner that is acceptable. We can think of cultural capital, knowledge of, of culture as also a way of obtaining status. And for the French uh, philosopher and social theorist Pierre Bourdieu, who came up with this four part scheme of social capital, um, he also thought about symbolic capital as the ability to interchange these different forms. But I would also suggest that there's another form of capital and that's aesthetic capital, right? Being able to describe aesthetically either the order of politics, what we might call the hegemonic order, or a challenge to it. And for us to think about which side of that divide we may be on will determine our social status. If we look at this uh, photo montage from the, the great John Hertzfeld, uh, a 1930s caricature right, of Hitler, we can immediately determine our own politics, whether we understand this as a joke, as a parody, or as an offense. And remembering, right, that there are plenty of Germans at the time that this was published in 1937, who would have taken great offense at this parody of Hitler, right, eating stomach of gold. We can also then think about this space-time continuum in the sense of how things might be associated with one another. That is, where do things belong and how might things be conjoined or not conjoined? This is a Second World War poster from the fascist regime in Croatia, the Ustasa. And this Ustasa poster makes a very interesting combination here. It disrupts space and time in many ways. The caption of the poster says, beware of partisans, that's the top line. And the bottom line is, beware of typhus. And here we see a Laos with the head of a partisan on it. And we've combined then, right, the partisan and the Laos. We've made the equivalence, or the Ustasha has made the equivalence, that partisans are as dangerous and as contagious as typhus, and that typhus is, right, the political responsibility of the partisan. We see then this juxtaposition, a causality of who's responsible for this dangerous situation. And we can also think about space-time in another way. So Joseph Beuys, the rather famous German contemporary artist in 1980, created this work called uh, Versaschaftewerk, uh, 
or economic values. And economic values was basically the placement of everyday objects on sets of workmen's shelves, but in a museum, with then very famous 19th century paintings behind this collection of soap and detergent, of baking goods, of um, small linseed oil boxes. And part of what boys also wanted to do was not only have everyday objects, but to leave them. And so as this piece of art goes on, the packaging fades, the things inside, they, they become dry, they become discolored. Um, and as such, right, this is an ever-changing piece, but what does it mean to see a bar of soap in a museum? And how does that change our idea of that? And Martha Rosler, a very well-known contemporary artist, um, did two rounds of work reprising what she had done originally in the 1970s, Home Beautiful, as a critique of the Vietnam War. She reprised it in the 2000s as a critique of the war in Iraq. And here she juxtaposes right, domestic scenes with then objects that we don't expect in the background. We see troops, uh, attacking Fallujah through the large um, sliding glass windows. We see two dead children in the lounge chairs in the living room, and we see sensibly a housewife right, who is completely obsessed with her own selfie to the point where she doesn't notice the attack in the background. This juxtaposition of objects, like the first iteration of Home Beautiful, where in one of the series, Rosler places First Lady Pat Nixon right in the White House, but with a dead child from, from Vietnam uh, behind her. And here you can see that a little bit better um, in the close-up. By disturbing the order of things, by also disturbing what we expect as a work of art, in the way that Boyce suggests that perhaps placing a bar of soap on a shelf is actually a work of art. We play with what is aesthetically pleasing, what is beautiful, and perhaps most importantly, we play with what is art for. And this becomes a way of challenging who gets to speak or how they speak. We might actually hear perhaps something new. We can also think of these juxtapositions of things being where we might not expect them. So this is actually a, a, a very interesting series of pieces by Saul LeWitt. Uh, this was for a project called the Project in Munster. And here, this sculpture is just a big black piece of concrete right in front of the Munster uh, town hall. And here, this abstraction to the square, to the town hall, here we can see it a little bit in, in close-up, was a reminder of an absence. It was a reminder of the Jews who had been killed during the Second World War. And this idea that someone would have to walk around this obstruction was intended by Lewitt as a way of suggesting that we are all walking around voids. We are walking around the missing. Likewise, this is a piece uh, called The Monument to the Murdered Jews of Europe uh, by Edward Musselman. This is in Berlin. And this too is a disruption of the Berlin landscape. And yet it's an interesting piece that I think asks the audience, how are they supposed to engage? Perhaps in a way that maybe Levitt's piece is a bit too direct. Here we see these monuments and Perhaps, I'm, I'm not sure how this translates in the slide, but there's a slight downslope if you're moving from right to left. So the, the woman in the green shirt is lower than the woman in the jeans in the far right. And that downslope continues even as the stones in the monument keep coming up. And so people start to disappear into the monument and the monuments themselves start to become closer and closer. And the idea from Muslim was that this is supposed to convey the confusion and the disorientation of the Holocaust and that people who had once been right next to you suddenly disappeared. And many people are quite upset by the way that say, people are just sitting on these blocks. Someone's looking at their telephone in the center. Sometimes people eat their lunch here. And yet, perhaps that is a real statement of the way that people didn't notice other people disappearing. Um, and perhaps itself is a way of thinking about these disjunctures of space and time. Rachel Whiteread 
won the Turner Prize back in 1993 for doing something very similar, where she very, this is her kind of signature of, of sculpture, she filled a building that was slated for demolition with concrete. So we actually see the interior of that which is now missing. This idea of yet another piece that reminds us of, of an absence. Here, she asked, what does it mean to tear down a house? And what do we lose? I think it's something interesting for us to think about the connection between house and say the monument to the murdered Jews of Europe. I mean, one has a very grand title, one has a modest title, and yet both of these pieces remind us right, of absences and presences. And perhaps maybe most famously of, of this in terms of monumental art would be Maya Lin's very famous piece from 1982, the uh, Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. This V shape cut into the lawn just off of the National Mall in Washington, D.C. A very revolutionary piece of art, which has all of the names of the dead from the Vietnam War from American service and not placed in alphabetical order, but placed in chronological order where the height of the, the war right, can really be seen in terms of the amount of, of death that happens in this piece. And moreover, the names aren't in alphabetical order, they're actually grouped together by death, so that if two comrades fell in the same battle and their families are looking for the people that their loved one wrote home about, they can find them. I think this is a really powerful piece where Maya Lin uses this very, very polished marble, so we see ourselves in this memorial. In a way, the living are present with the dead. The living can see the names of the dead and be reminded and be emotionally affected, but life, life goes on. But many people were quite upset by this piece. And in fact, so upset that by 1984, a new Vietnam Memorial had to be commissioned, this one by Frederick Hart called Three Soldiers, because the perception was that somehow Maya Lin wasn't capturing the heroism of the war, merely the violence of the war, merely these names. And yet these three figures, very masculine, they're supposed to represent, uh, one's supposed to be Caucasian, one's supposed to be African-American, when it's supposed to be Latino to kind of celebrate this uh, brotherhood in arms. But I think there's something almost flat here. And yet the established order was very upset with Maya Lin and felt this need to replace her. And I think as we go into our conversation today, um, it's interesting for us to think about what is provocative, what is playful. And so I'd like to even push a bit further to suggest that you know, this kind of challenge, these works of imagination, um, aren't just the monumental that appear in a museum or that are sanctioned by a government, but for us to think about ephemera, the, the poster, the graffiti. Here is a series of posters from a um, San Francisco art collective called, called Force Crew that um, wanted to protest uh, the American invasion of Iraq, and they are parodying uh, the iPod advertisement campaign by Apple uh, that was very popular um, at the time. And this is very early in the war. Um, you probably can't read it, but the bottom of the poster mirrors right, the tagline from Apple about how many tunes were available on iTunes for the iPod. And here we see 10,000 Iraqis killed, 773 US soldiers dead, as if that is a play list. I think there's something interesting about creating art in this spirited way, graffiti transforming space, transforming the space of the street into a space of expression. And here we actually see a critique of the Hungarian uh, government, the Hungarian regime in a graffiti piece in, in, uh, in Budapest. Uh, we understand this as a piece of graffiti critiquing the government uh, because the, the mask or the, the covering that's hiding the man's mouth is orange, which is the color of um, Fidesz, the ruling party um, um, campaign colors. And we see this suggestion, right, that Orban and Fidesz are silencing people and that to draw attention to that silence, we need to transform spaces, to make new places, to be able to communicate what we think of that established order. We can think then about the way that art itself can be playful. And, and I think there's something interesting, as Rancière suggests, that play is not a game. Um, because games have rules. So if we think like 
uh, Donald Winnicott, the famous British uh, psychoanalyst, if we think about play, it's actually between the gaps, between the boundaries. If we think about art as being playful, we can think of those conventions about what constitutes quote unquote appropriate aesthetics, appropriate places for the reflection of those aesthetics, and then to think about how we might play with them, play to a very serious end, or perhaps play to a very playful end. But I think in both cases, for us to think about who is trying to establish the order by which something is seen to be in the proper place, and how do we react when we actually see something perhaps out of place. And it's in seeing something out of place that perhaps we can gain a sense that anything is possible. Um, and I think here, if we think about the ways then that the politics of art right, kind of suspend the normal coordinates of sensory per um, perception, that is, we can think about the way that art tests how we are responding to things. And if we listen to ourselves, and if we listen to our own reactions, we might see something very, very new. We might actually see something as new as Zahara Husanani in 2021, just this past spring in March, replaced the Buddha. Uh, now the Buddha is just there in an ephemeral way. The performance was called One Night with the Buddha. Um, it is a projection of uh, a photograph of the original Buddha. But here, the Buddha has been put back into place. Now, in a way, it's put back into place as ephemera to remind us of its absence. But perhaps by seeing it back in place, we can think about those possibilities. We can think about maybe a world in which the Taliban had not destroyed those things. Or we might think about the possibility of the world in which the Taliban has destroyed those things. And how might we create something wholly new? So thank you. And uh, I look forward to, to the conversation and I look forward to, to everyone's uh, questions. Um, uh, we're now going to move to the Q&A portion of tonight's Saints talk. So um, as I say, please put your uh, questions in the chat bar. Um, and uh, if, if you uh, uh, try, try not to put your full name as we will try, uh, I'll have to uh, uh, read them out anonymously. So um, we're also going to put a link to our event survey in the chat bar. That's not a rating of Dr. Muir. It's an opportunity for us to, to get some feedback on these events in terms of the timing and other aspects of them. So if you do have a moment to fill that out, that would be appreciated. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with uh, uh, an anonymous question, but this was a very, a very wide range. Theory. Is there anything in terms of art and politics that doesn't fit within it? Well, well, thank you, David. I mean, I think that's a, it's a really interesting question because part of, especially from this perspective from Ranciere and thinking about how right, politics is about establishing order, then we can think about the ways that the aesthetic order itself is its own political regime, that every political regime has its own kind of aesthetic regime. And as such, any challenge to that right, is equally political, but we might think of the ways that very playful things, if it's challenging an aesthetic regime, would have to be understood broadly as art. So if we think about the ways that say something like hip hop right, challenges the you know, hegemonic aesthetic order, now, the hegemonic established order, which sounds really fancy and really big, I mean, we might think, oh, that's classical music. I mean, in the United States in the 1970s, we might think of the established hegemonic order, right, as being glam rock, right, about the capitalist organization of music consumption and that underground DJs, uh, you know, MCs, they're challenging that, right? And in this sense, we can think of graffiti art, we can think of hip hop as art, we can think of break dancing in the same way that we might think of ballet, right, as an aesthetic form that reflects certain kinds of music, certain kinds of values. And it is worth noting, I, I, I don't know if the 2020 
Olympics are going to actually happen in 2021, uh, but there is an event of competitive breakdancing. Uh, I would suggest here that we may have gone full circle, and now if there is competitive breakdancing at the Olympics, it's probably not challenging the hegemonic established order, it has probably become the hegemonic established order. And as such, right, we can think of these things as being cyclical, but it's about their location. It's relational in this way. And I think it's about that relationality then that allows us to think about where those boundaries might, might be. Thanks. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, another anonymous question. Why was Barnett Newman's painting so provocative, do you think? Well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think if you've ever gone to a contemporary art gallery, you can well imagine how it's so uh, challenging. All you have to do is walk through a contemporary art gallery and hear someone say, I can do that, right? Or, my child can do that. Like, what, what, is, what is this, right? What, why is this big, gigantic red painting in the Stedelijk Museum, the state museum of, uh, the city museum of Amsterdam? Um, and I think it challenges people. What, why is this art? How is this Art. Why am I looking right, at a red splash? Perhaps equally, right, we can think of the, um, the painting of Pierre Solage uh, and um, Natalie Adamson at the University of St. Andrews is a, a specialist in, in Solage. He, he paints black canvases. And people look at Solage and they, they, their minds explode. Like, why am I looking at a canvas of black? And yet Solage is painting like, like Newman's painting of the red. It's not just black and it's not just one coat. It's layer upon layer upon layer. And Solage, like Newman, is asking us, what do we see? And here we might think about Hans Sturge Gadamer, the kind of famous phenomenologist, the German philosopher. Gadamer suggests that when we encounter a work of art, we have to think about how open to it are we. And if we're open to it, Part of what we explore is not just the, the piece itself, but ourselves. Um, this is also what Ranciere suggests is the way of becoming an emancipated spectator, is that we're being reflexive about our own expectations. But I think for a lot of people, that, that, that's a big ask. And to walk into a museum and to see this big red thing, with the, then this kind of electric glow of blue and yellow on the, on the ends, People just, they didn't understand it. And I think it was offensive for a lot of people who said, you know, I, I don't understand this. I don't understand the money, I, but perhaps it's also, are you making fun of me, right? Are, are you condescending? Are you the elites of the museum condescending to me by saying this is art and I don't get it. Um, I think this is how this established order, it plays with how people feel like they fit into the established order. Great, uh, great question here from Nicole. Um, as art is a reflection of a certain political time, do you believe we can shape a new political era through art? No. It, it's such a it's such a great question. Thank you, thank you for that. I I have to say I think some of my uh, attraction to to this combination comes from that vision, right? Um, that um, I'm very, very taken with the, the art movements um, of the early 20th century, the late 19th century, the early 20th century, whether that's arts and crafts here in Britain um, or Art Nouveau in, in France and, and Switzerland and Belgium or um, the Bauhaus in Germany. I mean, all of these movements thinking about the way to transform everyday life through aesthetics. Uh, the idea of, especially the Bauhaus, of making everyday objects pleasing, pleasing by weight, pleasing by touch, pleasing by sight, by auditory. And I think a lot of these movements, they're not just the visual arts, right? They're all of the plastic arts. And I think it's interesting for us to think about these combinations, music and dance, theater, all coming together. I'd like to think that it is possible, right? And, and it's possible because it's in the artistic space, whether it's the gallery space of the theater, the musical space or the street, Right, that we can start to see maybe what's problematic in society, 
like who's not speaking maybe is a question. Um, when we think about see, monuments, as we think about decolonizing monuments in the present, whether it's in Britain or in, in the United States, whether we're talking about Confederate uh, statues in the US or thinking about say, someone like Cecil Rhodes and, and people that were connected with the slave trade here in Britain. What does to ask that question? What did that piece of art represent then and what does it represent now? And you know, frankly, I don't think that tearing things down is always the answer, but I do think moving things is always a possibility. And and to that end, I would just say there is a very interesting place in Budapest called um, uh, Mem uh, Memorial Park where they moved like all the communist statues into one place. Um, and it's important to still be able to see them. Um, and there's kind of a joke, right? There are all these Lenins pointing to the future. Uh, when you come in, you kind of walk through almost like a almost like a wedding uh, kind of arch of Lenins pointing off into the future. But I think it says something about the future, right? And and what what that movement thought was possible. So I think just to to come back around, Nicole, is just to say, you know, I, I like the idea that aesthetics and art are important ways that we can challenge the status quo and maybe the basis on which we can build something very new. And, and perhaps for us to think about what does it mean to challenge even the, the, the constructs of the market, to challenge the constructs of capitalism, to think about the ways that aesthetics challenge those everyday values um, as well, which is what boys wanted to do in economic values for us to think about what are desirable objects. And just to pick up that on that question of who is and who isn't allowed to speak, um, what role do you think gender, perhaps specifically masculinity, plays in the configuration of spaces through art? Uh, I, again, a really important and fabulous question. And, and one, actually, I hope that uh, the Center for Art and Politics will, will address not just kind of abstractly and over a long period of time by inviting uh, a number of women artists uh, to speak about their own experiences and about their own work. But very particularly next semester, um, uh, the Center for Art and Politics will host Leslie Loco, uh, who had been the Dean of the Spitzer School of Architecture in New York. Um, and many of you may have seen the article that ran in The Guardian yesterday about the experience of students uh, feeling that they were harassed sexually, feeling that they were harassed racially, um, in the School of Architecture um, in, in London. And I, I think there's a lot to be said, right, about the ways that, that gender constructs right, are being reproduced in this established order. What constitutes good art? Right? What constitutes promising architecture? And who's on the jury? You know, to think about who wins the prize, who then becomes the next jury member, we can see the way, right, that power reinscribes itself. Now we often think of power as being, you know, in, in Whitehall or, you know, in these very important institutions. But if we think about the power of a jury, even the way that we think of how is the Booker Prize awarded, uh, this year's Turner Prize, right, the Booker Prize for Literature, but this year's Turner Prize for Art, um, all of the artists are collectives that for the first time, none of the nominees right, are individual people. And that, that jury is trying to say something new about collaborative projects, about not trying to create just the new superstar. Um, what does it mean to recognize politically powerful work uh, that isn't normally recognized? And I think the gender question is extremely important. Who's being exhibited? In which museum? Where? And, and even worse sometimes, Right, when there's the section for women's art, as opposed to it just being art. I mean, I think for us to think about how those challenges are understood, uh, Daria Martin, the, the 2018 Jarman Prize winner for um, uh, visual art for moving images, uh, she's very adamant about this, that, that her works of imagination are hers. But there's also something very important about a kind of feminist perspective here, which is about openness. It's about being reflexive, as I was saying earlier, about being open to the piece. And I think that 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 is really part of feminist theory about feminist values. And I think gender here is an extremely important question as we think about who is an artist and whose work gets seen and where it gets seen. Yeah, 
Well, there's a, there's a fascinating moment here, which I don't think is related to what you've just said and the previous question around gender, but it may be. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that, which is this question was first asked anonymously uh, and I was going to get it, Bessie. So apologies for not getting back to you, but now it's been asked uh, by Bessie with with her first name. So is it possible to destroy political speech, language, spoken words in a similar way as to how the assailant slashed the Barnett Newman painting? And what would that look like? Wow, uh, I mean, that, that's a, a really super question. And, and I think here, right, for us to think about speech in, in all of its symbolic forms, right? So that we can think about texts, we can think about music, we can think about a painting as different forms than of speech. And here, perhaps, I, I think actually, David, it does connect back to the, to the previous question, because if we think about where people can speak or how people can speak, like what are the terms of authorization? I mean, the, the idea that, that the police might shut down right, a rave uh, when that might be a form of speech, when the police might shut down a protest, right? then we can see that. And, oh, yeah, that's definitely shutting down speech. But, but maybe shutting down the rave is equally about speech. I mean, there's a place in New York called Five Points. Um, it's in Long Island City. It's been transformed now, but for a long time, it was like ground zero of really powerful graffiti art. Um, and this whole place was going to be destroyed because Amazon was thinking about putting its second headquarters there in Five Points. Um, what did it mean to destroy that graffiti art? A lot of people think graffiti is an eyesore, and maybe some of it's boring, right? You know, it's just names and tags and things like that. We can think about the ways then that that, that voice is erased, and perhaps tagging, right, is a way of speaking when there's no other outlet to speak. How can we hear that? And so I think the way that looks is is erasure, right, and and the and the lack of forum, right, in which those speech acts. Can, can take place. I'm, ju I'm just going to move to to a final question for this evening. Now, I usually try to find something quite simple and, and light to to end the talk, but I haven't been able to find that now. So we'll, we'll go back to the big questions. Um, could you please expand on the idea of aesthetic capital as it relates to your conception of politics? Yeah, so here we might think of, um, and I didn't want to go into elaborate discussion of Bourdieu's uh, notion of, of social capital, but if we think of you know, social capital as being um, basically another way of understanding status, right? And so we can think of money status, right? Someone has a lot of money, they have status. Someone who has a lot of social connections, right? They have status. Someone who knows a lot, right? About can speak multiple languages, you know, can can tell you, you know, which symphony it is by Beethoven, right? You know, that they have status. And we can think then about aesthetic capital as fitting in or not fitting in to that established order. That is, do you recognize the Shostakovich? Can you listen to the Shostakovich? Um, can you listen to Tupac Shakur? Right? That in a way, the, the structures of capital, they're not just hierarchical in the sense that there's one capital structure, but rather we can think of how status groups themselves orient right, different kinds of um, status measures. So a lot of my work, which is about violence, right, talks about the ways in which someone who commits violence for the quote unquote right reason may get status. So we can think about a soldier or we can think about a police officer, but we can think about a gang member in a gang who through that act of violence gains social status. So not being able to listen to Shostakovich, but being able to listen to Tupac Shakur, right, it may actually be a way of gaining social status. I'll just say, and I'm gonna date myself here, right? But I'm, I'm happy to date myself. So when I was growing up in high school, and I was into the punk rock scene, I actually had hair back then. Um, that, that hair was sometimes different colors. Right? Nothing was more important to aesthetic capital in the punk scene than to know a band that no one else knew. <laughs>
Now, it seems counterintuitive, right? Because this is about social capital, but it was the notion that somehow you were so cutting edge that you were the only person to have ever seen, I'm, I'm gonna name a band that maybe everyone knows, but you know, the only person to have seen Black Flag when they first played. Um, when they first played, nobody knows that Black Flag is gonna be this really emblematic punk rock group, but it's still delivered aesthetic capital in that sense. I mean, we can think of it as a byproduct or as an offshoot of cultural capital or, or social capital, but it's specifically tied to an aesthetic knowledge. And I think that's what makes it different. Thanks so much, Dr. Mira. And uh, when I was growing up in high school, I had to date myself too. Um, you'll be pleased to know. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time um, and, and to the audience. If, if you are able to um, fill in our survey, that would be greatly appreciated. We've also uh, put Dr. Mura's uh, email address into the chat bar. So if you've got any questions you'd like to follow up with him or comments, please feel free to do so. There were three or four questions we didn't get to and apologies um, for not picking them out. This I tried to do it as, as randomly as possible. Um, in two weeks time, we're having our last uh, Saints talk of the uh, academic year, where we will be, I will be joined uh, by Dr. Neil McGuigan, who has just published a new biography of King Malcolm III of Scotland, arguably uh, the medieval king, although this is often, uh, medieval kings are often argued to be this person, arguably the medieval king who, who most created a Scotland uh, that viewed itself as a, as a peer to England, and whose 35 year reign created that dynastic ambition that lasted for 200 years up to the wars of independence. Um, you can uh, watch previous Saints talks on our, on our YouTube channel, uh, and you can also follow us via Instagram, Instagram uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter. Um, thanks again uh, to you all for, for taking the time out of your evenings to join us, and, and I'll, I'll leave the final word to uh, Dr. Muro. Thank you. That's great. Well, and, and thank you, David, very much for, for moderating this and, and for being my host. I'd also like to thank um, Audrey Dice for, for the invitation um, to Colin Reed for the technical assistance um, here. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for coming uh, this evening and, and spending your time with us. Um, I'd just like to say, please do uh, check out the Center for Art and Politics webpage. Um, there's lots of programming, as I mentioned, the Leslie Loco um, piece that will that will be in the autumn. There are some other pieces as well. So do um, take a look at the Center for Art and Politics. And if you do have a question and we didn't get to your question, please feel free to, to email me and I will try to, to address your question um, in due course or as soon as possible. And I would just like to say um, a, a very nice warm hello to Pinar. Thank you for coming. Pinar is one of my former PhD students, so it's nice to see um, people in in the uh, conversation here. So thank you very much, David, and, and thank you all for, for being the audience this evening.